We are picking up from chapter 17, Pasuk 8. When we last <laughs> left off, we are at the very suspenseful tissues. moment where Goliath, the hero of the Plishtim, had come out to propose a challenge. And he said to the Jewish people, rather than having back and forth battles okay. between our armies, let's appoint one man from each army. I'll represent the Plishtim and send anyone you'd like. And whoever wins the battle will, will be the victor and the other will be the slaves. So we'll be your slaves if you win and we'll be and you'll be our slaves if we win. Um, and that was the deal that Goliath had proposed. If you look at his language, verse number eight, it says, Lama Why should you go out to uh, wage a war? Hello, Anuchi Pelishti. I am the Philistine. And you are slaves to Shaul. What does it mean, I am the Philistine? Here, uh, uh, Goliath was bragging about his track record. He says, I'm the one who killed Chofni and Pinchas, the sons of Aaron, and of, uh, of Eli, excuse me. And I'm the one who took the ark captive. You remember when the Philistines initially took the ark captive so many chapters ago, uh, Goliath is now revealing that he was the one that was primarily in charge of that. He was the war hero of the Plishtim, and I wreaked all this uh, havoc, and I caused this damage to the Jews. I am the Plishti. And you guys are the slaves of Shaul who has not been able to help you choose somebody to come fight against me. And then in verse number 10, Chazal sees something more significant. And the Plishti said, um, which translates, I've disgraced the battalions of Israel this day. And he says like this, Tznuli ish, give me a man, and we will fight together. What does he mean, Tznuli ish, give me a man? Chazal say this was, on the surface, it meant a human being, give me a man to fight with. But this is referring to what we read two weeks ago, Hashem ish milchama. God refers to himself as the ish milchama, the wager of wars. When Goliath said, Tznuli ish, Chazal saw in that that he was referring to God himself. And he said, give me, God to fight with, and I will defeat him. But this wasn't just a fight between two nations over uh, some some physical space. This was a spiritual battle of good versus evil. It was Goliath versus God, in other words. And he was here challenging and blaspheming God with his statements. And the tragic response in verse number 11, Vaishma Sha'ul v'chol Israel, Saul and all of Israel heard how he was blaspheming and disgracing God. And they were all scared, exceedingly worried. They trembled and they were all exceedingly scared. And that includes Shaul, Saul. Here you see the tragic downfall of Shaul. As we said, and uh, we saw earlier, the spirit of Hashem had left Saul when once David was anointed. And look at the results, that you could have the enemy blaspheming God, and he sits there scared and doesn't do anything. That is the result of the spirit of God leaving Shaul. And we'll see soon that the reaction of David was just the opposite. When he heard the blaspheming, he was he rose to action. And Shaul himself, if you recall, a few uh, a chapter or two ago, he was defeating the Philistines in, in a very strong way, in a very strong way. But once God had left him, it was it was over for Shaul. And that's where David comes in. Here in the middle of chapter seventeen, I don't know who iPhone is. It might be the Wolperts. It's nice to see you. Don't be bashful. The David ben Isha Prati, uh, David. It's, we here we have the introduction of David. If you cue the music. It's, it's chapter seventeen, verse twelve. David. We suddenly get his background again, even though we've heard about him already. It sounds like since he's rising to a position of prominence with the episode that's about to unfold, we give him like a new introduction. He is the man of Ephrat, mi Beit Lechem. Ephrat is an area in Yehuda, within which the city of Beit Lechem is, which is where David is from. Uh, and in that city, there was a man, Yishai, and he had eight sons. David is included amongst the eight now, and not seven. Um, and Yishai was a man of, of high regard. Um, Baba Anashim, 
Rashi, what is that again? Anytime they had to gather important people, Yishai was always invited. Jesse was always invited. He was an, an important, prominent person. Okay. So rather than accepting the challenge of Goliath to have a one versus one, the Navi now tells us that they continued having individual, they continued having small battles. Nobody wanted to take on Goliath's, uh, Goliath's, um, his, his offer. And therefore they continued having regular battles. And so Jesse sent his three sons, his three older sons, to go with Shaul to the war. And the three older sons were named Eliav, he was the firstborn, and then Avinadav, and then Shama. And David, this is verse number 14, with David Huha Katan, he was the small one. And the three big ones went after Shaul. There were eight sons in total. The three oldest went to the war, to the front lines, and David stayed behind. He was taking care of the flocks, evidently, even though last time Shaul had insisted that David stay and play in his palace and, and remain in his presence constantly. Evidently, uh, David still stayed, would return to Bethlehem and tend to his father's sheep. Uh, he didn't He didn't stay permanently with Shaul. Uh, as it says in verse number 15, He would go and come from Shaul from playing music for Shaul and helping him in, in his own quarters, back to Beit Lechem to take care of his father's sheep. And here in verse number 16, And the Philistine, Goliath, he would approach the Jewish camps, in the morning and in the evening. And he stood there for 40 days, 40 days, morning and night. Um, like the Navi is kind of like building suspense here where the, the camera pans to David you see this young man in the fields and then it pans back to Goliath you see that he's day and night for 40 days he's taunting the Jewish people and cursing God what's the significance of 40 days and what's the significance of day and night so Chazal say the 40 days fascinatingly correspond to the 40 steps that Orpah took towards Israel with Naomi. You recall Orpah was the great-grandmother of Goliath, and she was the one that accompanied Naomi back to her homeland of Eretz, of Eretz Israel, and she took 40 steps with her, as if to say, I'm coming with you. And then Naomi tried to discourage her and Ruth, and she said, even if I gave birth to sons today, it wouldn't be worth it to stick around. So Ruth stayed with Naomi and she ended up converting. That's the, that's the, uh, the great-grandmother of David. But Orpah, she turned away. And Chazal say that those 40 steps, in the merit of those 40 steps that she took in her initial decision to follow after Naomi and to convert, the initial 40 steps that she took, in the merit of those 40 steps, her great-grandson Goliath was given 40 days of rule, that he was able to stand in front of the camp of Israel untouched and unchallenged, which is so interesting. You would think that the reward for the good gesture of for taking 40 steps towards Israel should be rewarded with, I don't know, 40, 40 boys in yeshiva or 40 days learning Torah. Here it was 40 days cursing God. It's fascinating how it turned into a, a negative, but this was, after all, a reward for Orpah. Uh, in the merit of the 40 steps she took, the Goliath got 40 days of, of being unchallenged. Now, why did he challenge the Jewish people, specifically Hashkem the Ha'aret, morning and night? It could be the simple meaning is just day and night he was bothering. It's an expression, day and night he was cursing God and taunting him, he didn't do anything about it. But Chazal actually revealed that he was timing the taunting very specifically. He knew that the Jews have a mitzvah of Kriyat Shema, of reading the Shema, when you, rise, when you lay to rest and when you rise in the morning. And he knew that in as much as the Jewish people are connected to God, he's threatened. So he wanted specifically to interrupt this daily prayer of the Shema that they would be saying in the morning and in the evening. He didn't want them to have focus. He didn't want them to be able to say it. So it was at those times that he came out to taunt and to scare the Jews so they wouldn't be able to, to recite the Shema properly. Fascinating. Vayomer, let's, let's move forward. Verse number 17. Jesse says to his son David, why don't you take um, 
some some uh, <clears throat> food to your brothers and go look and see how they're doing. Recall, David's older brothers are on the front lines of war and David is at home with his father. So his father sends him, take some, take some food and some milk and inquire after the welfare of your brothers and send me back a report. This is the last words in verse number 18 is ve'et arubatam tikach. You should send me back a report of their of their well-being. How are they doing? Go check on how they're doing. Good evening, Mr. Levine. Chazal tell us that the word arubatam here actually means, uh, if, if, on the one hand, it means their well-being. Go see after their well-being. Additionally, it means take divorce documents that they should sign. It was the custom in Jewish armies that before they went out to war, or when they went out to war, the husbands would write and sign a divorce document, a get for their wives, that in the event that they go missing and they don't return from the war, their wife is considered divorced. If they would <clears throat> go missing and it's you cannot confirm that they're dead, then the, the woman has a status of an aguna. She's trapped in the marriage. She cannot marry another man because her husband might still be alive. And she can't get divorced because you don't know where he is. So the custom of the Jewish soldiers was soldiers was to write a divorce document for their wives before going out to war. So et aruba tamtikach, and eruv is a mixture. The thing that combines, that mixes, that, that brings together the husband and wife, take the divorce document, um, which which separates that, and 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 get get it signed so you can bring it back to their wives. Just an interesting technical uh, historical point. So David now goes to see his brothers. In verse number 20, David wakes up early, right, to fulfill the will of his father by Ashkem. He wakes up early and he leaves, he deposits the sheep with a guardian, right? His job was to look after the sheep, but he needs to get a, a replacement shepherd in his absence. And he goes as his father commanded him. Kasher Tziva, as his father commanded him, this is going to be a specific, uh, this is an interesting point and an important line, I believe. He had no other intention other than to fulfill the will of his father. A different lad perhaps would be excited. You know, you get to sit in the front lines and I get to see what's going on up there. Maybe I'll get some action. That was not his intention. And he's going to be accused of being war hungry. And we see from here that his intention in going there was purely to serve his father and to fulfill his will. So he comes to the circle. They had a circle. Uh, that nobody should leave. You know, you don't want to endanger yourself by exiting the boundaries of safety. So they would make a circle. And he comes to the circle. And he sees everyone uh, basically engaged in war. So he needs to find his brothers. So he goes towards the front lines. And suddenly, his ears perk up. And in verse number 23, it says, He's speaking to his brothers. And here comes the middleman, Goliath, the one who would stand between the mountains. And last time we spoke about the other significance of that nickname, the middleman. And here comes Goliath. David had never heard this before. He's been tending to the sheep in Bethlehem. And suddenly David hears for the first time the blaspheming that Goliath is doing. That he's saying, Send me a, a man that I could fight with, and he's and he's cursing God and cursing the Jewish people. Vaishma David and David hears this. And now David looks around and in verse number 24. And he sees how once Goliath starts speaking and taunting the Jews, everyone scattered. They were terrified of this absolute giant. We said last time he was 10 or more feet, and he had tremendous amounts of armor and protection. He, and he has a track record of being very destructive. He was the one who took the Ark of God captive. He was the one who killed Elia Cohen's sons. And here he is proud of it. And everyone scattered. And they would say to one another in verse number 25, Did you see this man going up? Because he's coming to curse us. Um, and people were schmoozing amongst themselves. Anybody who strikes him down, the king promised to make him rich, exceedingly rich, and he will. The king Shaul will give his daughter to him as a reward. And you should make the father's house free. 
I guess, free of taxes or whatever demands the king has on the people, Shaul basically gave a, a reward. Anybody who could defeat this beast, the Goliath, he'll be made rich. He will get the daughter of the king. Uh, and he will he will be relieved of any uh, impositions that, that the king has. He'll be a free man. So David hears all this. He hears Goliath cursing and he hears about the reward. David says to the people, Tell me again, what will be done to the person who strikes the Philistine and removes the disgrace from Israel? So David heard what the reward will be. But instant, as soon as David saw what was going on, he decided he wants to be the one to face David, to face Goliath. If no one's going to do it, then I'm going to step forward and challenge him. But it would be disrespectful to go straight to Shaul. He was, he was just the arms bearer and just a young lad. So instead, he decides to start asking around, hey, what's that reward that Shaul promised to whoever fights against the Plishti? As if to say, I'm willing to do it. So he's trying to, to spread the news that he's willing to do it. But listen to hear how he... How he um, how he puts it in the end of verse 26. Who is this uncircumcised plishti who is cursing the, the ma'arachot, the legions of the living God? He's not just cursing our army. He's cursing the legions of God. David was able to frame this war properly like nobody else appreciated. Everyone else thought it was a battle between two powers. This is a battle between good and evil. This man is cursing Marachot Elokim Chaim. The living God's armies are being cursed. That is that is something that you can't put up with. And therefore, I'm going to fight. I don't care who, who it is or who I am. I'm going to fight against it. So, in verse number 28, Vaishma Eliav Achiva Gadol, Eliav, the older brother, the eldest in the family, he hears... Eventually, the rumors come to his ear. Hey, your little brother David wants to go fight against this giant. And it says, af David. The wrath of Eliav flared against David. And he says to him, Lama Why have you come here? And who did you abandon the sheep with? In the desert. Yeah, you're being neglectful of the sheep. I know that you are sinning right now. I know, I know the evil intention in your heart. You just came down to, to see some fighting. You just came down to get a taste of fighting. So here you have an accusatory statement made by Eliav. Eliav, who we know, was a holy person. Shmuel thought that he was fit to be the king. Here we see him uh, lashing out in anger against his younger brother David. This tells us a few things. This shows you the reputation David have, has amongst his brothers. <laughs> the fact that his holy brother... Eliab can suspect David of doing such a base thing as just going out, you know, war hungry, abandoning, abandoning your post, abandoning your father's sheep and running out to the war. It shows you the impression they had of him, that he was like neglected amongst the house. Nobody appreciated who he actually was. It also shows that David seemed like he had a natural propensity towards fighting and anger, like the look on his face, that ruddy look that he had. And the thirdly, Chazal tell us that it's this instance of anger that actually invalidated Eliab, that what made Eliab unworthy of being the next king was because of this uh, lashing out of anger. That's not, some, that's not something that a leader can have. You have to know your people, and you have to know that this is not something that David's capable of, doing the evil that you're speaking. And to lash out in anger and let that emotion overtake you is not something that's fit for a king. And so it's this incident, actually, that made him lose the, the kingship. Yeah, Mr. Fox. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, th this part that you're reading now, it appears that David is there for the first time. But yet earlier, uh, we have that David would travel back and forth from Saul's presence to his father's flocks. Good so back, back and forth means he's traveling both ways frequently. Good. Very good. So frequently. Earlier, what it was saying was he would travel back and forth from Bethlehem to, to the house of Shaul to be his attendant and to play music for him. In gen that's like generally speaking. But now, Shaul has left his palace or his home and gone to the front lines of war. So, so the early verse is not necessarily referring to when Shaul was in the front lines of war. And I think that okay. that's the resolution. And, and didn't David's brothers know that he was anointed king? 
Yes. That's interesting. You see, they, they, like they saw that, but I guess they didn't see any significance with, with this particular instance. Like, what are you doing here? Nobody asked you to be here. So it must just be, you know, like you're bloodthirsty. It's interesting to consider. Yeah, they, they saw that he is the anointed one of God, and yet they're still capable of lashing out angrily at him. I shouldn't say they, Eliav, the, the, the firstborn, is still capable. Yeah, I guess that's the way of anger. <coughs> anger makes you irrational. Perhaps that's why he is so heavily uh, criticized for this instance. For, for this, they say he lost the kingship. I guess it was irrational. He was just being angry. Yeah, good po good point. <clears throat> okay. Um, so David responds, I haven't I have not done anything, uh, or what have I done? Hello, I just I just spoke, I didn't do anything. Uh, of course, Eliab didn't realize that it was Jesse, his father, who had sent David here to check on them on them. Uh, anyway, David continues his pursuit. He's trying to get to Shaul to inform him that he wants to, to fight Goliath. By so he turns away from Eliab. El Mula in verse number 30. And he goes to somebody else and he says the same thing. What's the reward for somebody who's going to fight against Goliath? Who's that person? And listen to that person cursing our people. And people just kept telling him, oh, the reward is you get to marry the king's daughter, etc. And then eventually, eventually the words of David were heard. And they were stated in front of Shaul, and they brought David to face Saul. Now David says to Shaul, let not the heart of, him, of any person fall because of Goliath. Your servant, I, David, will go and I will fight against this Philistine. So, here you have David, who's willing to go and battle against the, the Philistine. And Shaul actually put out a reward for anybody who's willing to do this. And yet we see the, the reply in verse number 33. Shaul says to David, No, you can't. You can't go. He, you're just a young lad. And he is a man of war, meaning Rab. And he's been fighting wars from his, from his youth. You see the, the cowardice. It's just sad to see Shaul in such a, such a fallen state. He doesn't see the the urgency and the necessity to fight against Goliath like David does. Vayomer David el Shaul, and now David reveals a certain incident that had occurred to him. He says, "You know, I was tending to my father's sheep, ubaha ari ve'et hadov, v'nasa semeha'eder, and a lion and a bear came, and they took a sheep from the flock." And I struck down the animals and I saved the sheep and I grabbed the lion by the beard and I killed it. Also the lion, also the bear I struck down. And this Philistine, this Plishti, this uncircumcised will be like the lion and the bear. Because he has cursed the the uh, the battalions of the living God. So here we're finding some background information we didn't know. That David apparently had a run-in with a lion and a bear, and he killed them. And David's now revealing that to Shaul, and he said, Listen, I had this incident. Hashem apparently has given me a strong power, and this was a sign for me that I'm fit to fight against Goliath. There's a lot to share. I'm just going to highlight a couple. Chazal uh, points to verse number 36. There seems to be extra language here, certainly in the Hebrew. Um, yeah, in English you don't see it. Yeah, even the lion and the bear. So, gam et ha'ari, gam hadov. These are expressions that are a bit redundant. Uh, Chazal say that together with the lion, there were two lion cubs, and together with, their, with the bear, there was one bear cub. So it wasn't just one lion and one bear that he struck. If that wasn't enough to strike a lion and a bear, there was actually uh, three lions and two bears. There was five animals altogether that David had struck down. So this was quite a tremendous thing that he had just had done. Uh, another thing to point out 
in verse number 34, 34, um, the last two words is, uh, I took the sheep from the flock. Uh, or excuse me, the bear took the sheep from the flock. The word sheep in Hebrew is se. In the actual text, in the scroll of the prophet, is written ze with a zion. Rather than with a sin, which it should be spelled with, it's spelled with a zion, which means this. But the way we read it is sheep. Instead of saying, he took this from the flock, we say he took the sheep from the flock. But why does it say it with a zion, ze? The Vilna Gaon says, ze always indicates that you're pointing at something, or there's something that's here and now that David was talking about. David pointed at his shirt. He said, this, the lion took this from me. His shirt was made out of the fleece from that very sheep that he had saved. After the miracle, where Hashem had enabled him to overcome these animals that took the sheep, David wanted to make a, a reminder for himself of this great miracle that Hashem had done for him. So he made a shirt out of that fleece from the sheep that he saved. And so he said to Shaul, this, this sheep's fleece, this that I'm wearing right now, this is what I saved from the mouth of the lion and the bear, the lions and the bears. Uh, so this is remarkable. The Chazal say that two people were given a hint and they got the hint. The, uh, one was David, that when Hashem gave him the ability to fight against the lion and the bear, he didn't just say, wow, that was cool. What an amazing run-in with animals that I had. And he went on with his life. He took this as a sign. This is something significant. Why did I just bump into these animals? Why did this happen? If Hashem wants to protect me, he can just make sure the lions don't come. Hashem sent a lion and he enabled me to defeat it. This must indicate something's coming. And sure enough, when he hears about Goliath and how he's taunting the Jews, he said, oh, this must be what God was telling me, that I'm capable. He's going to give me the strength to fight against Goliath. So David took the hint and he realized this was a sign from Hashem that Hashem is with David and is going to enable him to defeat the enemy of the Jews. The other person that Hashem, Hashem sent a hint to, as tonight is Rosh Chodesh Adar, the first of Adar, was Mordechai. Mordechai saw that Esther had been taken into the king's palace, and she became the queen. And he thought to himself, what a strange series of events, that my niece should become the queen of, 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 of Achashverosh. It must be some salvation will come about through her. And sure enough, when he realized that there was a decree against the Jews, he is the one who pressured Esther and he said, you have to go. Who knows if this is the reason you you came, it's a time like this that you came to the palace for. You became the queen precisely for this reason. I Meaning he got the hint. Why did Hashem put you in such a strange situation? It must be, it's a tool for the future. So those are the two people in history who got the hint this uh, Midrash that Rashi brings down over here. So David reveals to Shaul that he has this uh, divine support because he was able to defeat the lions and the bear. And they're related. Who's related? Shaul and Mordechai. Oh, beautiful. That's interesting. Yes, very good. Very good. Huh. Yeah, very good. And this is beautiful. It's not David saying, I'm strong and I can defeat Goliath. Don't worry, I can do it. That's not at all. He says, Hashem who saved me from the lion and the bear, he will save me from this Philistine. That's verse number 36. And now fascinating, you have this again. There's a gap in the middle of the, of the sentence. The verse is not over yet, but there's a gap in the text. David says, Hashem saved me from them, he could save me from Goliath. Then the gap, Vayomer Shaul. Shaul responds, go, and Hashem will be with you. This is very significant. I feel that this gap, I don't know. I don't know why it's there. Perhaps it indicates a, a, a pause in Shaul, that Shaul had taken. Shaul is, is watching this in front of his eyes, where he sees, he knows that his kingship is taken away from him. And now he sees this young boy in front of him who, who, who has tremendous divine support. And if you recall earlier, when he was initially appointed to be the musician of Shaul, Doeg had talked to David up a lot. So he knows that David has the qualities of a king. And by him telling him to go and face Goliath, he might be realizing that this is the end of his reign. He might be realizing that by me sending off David, this is the end of Shaul and the beginning of the reign of David. So there's a pause in the text 
And then Shaul responds, Leich and Hashem ye imach, and God will be with you. Uh, perhaps this is Shaul's uh, at this, and like a moment of honesty where he really he realizes what's going on beneath the surface. This is completely my my thoughts for whatever they are worth, which is you'll decide. Okay. Vayalbe Shaul at David Nadav. Shaul uh, adorns David with his with his uh, uniform, and he gave him armor. David didn't have armor; he's a shepherd. So Shaul gives David his armor. Minatan Kovan Echoshed al Rosho, and he put. Uh, the copper helmet on his head and he dresses David with armor and he gives David his sword but sure enough David is not able to walk because he was not trained and David takes the armor off he says I can't go with this armor I'm not trained to walk with such armor and he takes the armor off and he goes to face Goliath without armor there's a lot going on in every Pasuk over here. Chazal say that when Shaul put his armor on David, miraculously, it fit him perfectly. Shaul was head and shoulders above the nation, which means he was actually taller than everybody. And yet his armor now fit on David. This is another divine sign that the, there's going to be a transfer from Saul to David. Um, but sure enough, David's not able to move when he's wearing the armor. Lo yoel either means he didn't want to or he wasn't able to. And those are both true. Number one is, it could be David realized, uh, I, this is in the Mepharshim, I just I forget who said what here. Uh, the, Vayikra Rabbah, the Midrash Rabbah says that David didn't want to make Shaul jealous. And he realized that it must be very painful for, for him to see David transitioning into the role of king. So David says, I'm not going to wear your armor. I, I'm not going to wear it. And he, he just said, oh, it's too heavy for me. I, I'm, I'm not trained to walk like this. And he takes off the armor to prevent the embarrassment and the jealousy of Shaul, which is incredible because he's about to go face Goliath and you would think he would want the armor. It shows you the, the deep trust he had in Hashem that he's going to make a miracle for him. Uh, another reason is that David wanted to magnify and amplify the fact that this is going to be a miraculous victory. I don't want the armor. Kilo nisa. The Targum, the Aramaic translation here says, because there would not be a miracle if I'm wearing armor. I need to show everyone that this is a miracle. This is not a natural fight anymore. The moment Goliath curses God, this is God versus Goliath. And I have to show that God is with me and I'm not wearing armor. It's pure God that's fighting here and not David. And if I'm wearing armor, people might get confused and think that it was my armor that protected me, etc. So I want to make sure and clear that it's a miraculous victory. He wasn't able to walk, he didn't want to walk. Uh, the simple meaning of the text is it was just too heavy for him and he couldn't walk with it. And so it's the three interpretations, if you will, of why he couldn't walk. Uh, and he takes a staff in his hand and five stones. Uh, the staff is for close combat fighting. And perhaps it was to create a diversion because, as we know, um, David didn't end up using the staff. He just slung a rocket at, uh, at Goliath. And he takes five stones with him from the stream. And he puts them in his shepherd's sack. Because you could think, like, how, how precious does this look? The young lad who is not trained in war is going out without any armor with his old shepherd's sack and takes five stones. And that's all. To go fight against this absolute giant. A stick, right? And a, a slingshot. And that's it. Why five stones? Because I'll say he had in mind that these should uh, revenge for five five different entities. One was for God, who Goliath was, curse, Goliath was cursing. One was for Aaron and the Kohanim, who Goliath had killed. Chofni and Pinchas, the two leaders of the Kohanim, Goliath had killed them. And the other three were for the Jewish people, the descendants of Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Right, one for God, one for the Kohanim, and three for the forefathers, uh, Rami Tzlak and Yaakov. So you see that this was a spiritual battle as far as David was concerned. He didn't need you know, so much practical equipment. Spiritual equipment was needed. So he, in the merit of God and the Kohanim and, and, and of the Avos, he was approaching Goliath. Goliath sees David coming. And he approaches David. And the uh, arms bearer was walking in front of Goliath. And Goliath looks at David and he just, and he makes fun of him. He uh, derides him. 
Okay, yeah, no. This is like a cute looking guy. He looks very pretty, a beautiful man, and a young lad. Absurd, the Goliath is thinking. And Goli and the, so the Philistine says to David, What am I, a dog that you come at me with a stick? And he curses David in the name of his God. Uh, this is fact. Chazal say that Hashem, uh, that, that the that the wicked man uttered his own truth. He says, am I a dog? Did you come after me with a stick? You recall that Goliath's great grandmother is Orpah. And perhaps you recall last week we said that after she took those 40 steps towards Eretz Yisrael, she then departed from Naomi. And with that departing, she actually sunk to an extremely low level morally. And on that very night, she slept with 100 men and a dog. And a dog. And that's why the Goliath is referred to as Isha Beinaim, the man who came from amidst one of those, the man in between one of those uh, relations that she had, including the dog. So here Goliath is saying, What am I, a dog? Did you come after you with a staff? So the Gemara says, Ah, oh, that he, he himself referred to himself as a dog because he, in fact, is yeah, a part dog. Vayomer al David, Come to me. And I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and to the beasts of the field. Now, this was a cue to David that God was on his side because Goliath slipped up here. He made a mistake. The beast of the field, the behemah in Hebrew is a domesticated animal. Uh, the cows and the things he'd ra raise on a farm, those don't eat meat. And it was a mistake for Goliath to say it's just not true. The, the, the farm animals don't eat the flesh of a human. And so David realized that at this point, Hashem had already had already taken uh, Goliath's mind away, and Hashem was going to make him victorious. And that's perhaps what emboldens David to make the following statements, which we will have to read next time, God willing. Uh, so when we pick up next week, we'll be picking up at verse number 45 with the re reply of David Amelech to Goliath and, uh, and the ultimate defeat of Goliath. Not to give you a spoiler, but David's going to win. <laughs> All right. Have a good night. It's a pleasure learning with you. Thank you. Be well.